Welcome to uh, all of you uh, who have uh, opted to attend our, uh, our remote uh, online session. This is the second meeting of the contextualizing North African Christianity section. And it's a very special uh, task that I have uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is David Hunter and uh, with my colleague, uh, Jonathan Yates, uh, we will be introducing a, a festschrift for Professor James Patu Burns. And uh, so what I'd like to do uh, first is introduce uh, our uh, speakers here. All, the three of us will be doing an introduction and then uh, we'll be having three papers and then a, uh, a respondent. But let me just introduce my, my colleagues here uh, to my, uh, left um, is Professor James Patu Burns, uh, currently at the University of uh, Notre Dame. And below me there is uh, uh, Professor Jonathan Yates uh, at uh, Villanova University. And so our procedure here, uh, I'm gonna spend a few minutes just giving you a little bit of uh, overview of the, the book that um, is the, the Feshrif for Professor Burns, and then the three papers that are being presented, uh, all of them uh, recorded. Uh, the three papers are, um, in a sense, samples uh, related to the papers that are in, uh, that these three persons have contributed to the Feshrift. And then we will be having a, a response by uh, Han Nguyen Comline, uh, or Cancer Comline. Uh, the three talks are going to be first by Andrew McGowan of Berkeley School of Divinity at Yale, uh, and second Dennis Trout from the University of Missouri, uh, and then uh, Theodore DeBrun from the University of Ottawa, but coming to us from Hebrew University in, in Jerusalem. Well, I'd like to first begin by uh, saying something about this fresh riff volume that is being presented to Professor Burns. Um, the title, it's being published by Erdmans, but the title is Augustine and Tradition, Influences, Context, and Legacy. And as, as Jonathan's going to explain, uh, when we began to talk about the possibility of producing a volume of essays, we were acutely aware of the importance of uh, producing a unified volume, that is not simply a, a disparate collection of unrelated uh, essays uh, that would have been hard, uh, harder to get published, but we wanted to do something um, that was a genuine book that had some kind of internal uh, unity. But we also wanted to have a perspective that would in many ways shed some new light on the work of um, Augustine. Um, and so we began to think about a possible focus, a possible theme for the essays. And of course, immediately ran into the, the, the question of how can there be a focused enough theme and yet a theme that's broad enough to accommodate quite a wide uh, array of different scholars and, and different perspectives. So that was the, the, the essential dilemma that uh, we had, how to be focused enough to provide unity, but how to be um, broad enough to include a diversity of perspectives. And so we came up with uh, the rubric of Augustine and tradition. And what we had in mind was Augustine's relation to the very many different kinds of traditions that shape the world in which he emerged. Uh, some of these, I think, uh, that we adopted uh, are going to be, uh, were, were fairly obvious, how to relate Augustine to the philosophical tradition, for example, to Platonism, to Plotinus and Porphyry, uh, how to relate him to the classical uh, literary, the Latin literary tradition. So some were fairly obvious uh, topics. But some of them I think that we, we decided on were not uh, so immediately uh, obvious, but to us were very important. For example, to uh, have an essay that would 
look at the liturgical background and the liturgical world um, that Augustine was very much a part of, especially in his uh, preaching or the tradition, the North African tradition of, of martyrdom and martyrology. So what we, uh, what we finally decided on was uh, five different areas, um, well, actually four in the, in the final uh, volume. And the, the first section of the, the book um, is on the North African tradition. And this includes uh, an essay that uh, you'll get a sample of uh, this afternoon from Andrew McGowan, looking at the liturgical readings that uh, Augustine would have been responding to within the liturgical uh, seasons. Um, but also other North African figures such as uh, Atatus of Milevis, Tertullian, um, and, and also uh, a good look uh, by William Taberney on uh, traditions of martyrdom and, and martyrology. So the first section of the volume uh, includes <clears throat> actually five essays uh, on Augustine and the North African tradition. Uh, the second section of the book and we'll, again, we'll have a sample from that uh, as well this afternoon, is Augustine and the classical, philosophical, and literary traditions. So we have uh, an essay uh, on Augustine and the Platonists by John Peter Kenny. We have an essay on Augustine and Porphyry by Thomas Clemens, uh, an essay on Augustine and classical ethics, especially Cicero uh, by James Wetzel, and the one that you'll get a little sample of this afternoon uh, from Dennis Trout is Augustine and the classical Latin literary tradition, of course, especially Virgil. But again, among the other topics that we, we chose to, to use as this rubric uh, for Augustine and tradition is to look at Augustine in relation to other theologians, uh, both in the Greek tradition, and so we have an article on Augustine's uh, reception of origin, Augustine's use and reception of the Cappadocians and the Pelagian controversy, but also looking then, and this would be section four of the volume, uh, at Augustine and certain uh, Latin predecessors and contemporaries, and here Marius Victorinus, Ambrose, and Ambrosiaster are among the um, uh, the topics uh, of the individual chapters. And so the third paper you'll be hearing this afternoon from Theo de Grun will be dealing with Augustine and Ambrosi Esther. So that's a, a basic outline of the book that we'll be presenting to, um, uh, to Professor Burns. Uh, we don't have the hard copy yet. Um, we may have another event uh, later in the spring at the North American Patristics Society uh, to actually physically hand over the, uh, the volume to Professor Burns. Uh, in any case, that's all I'm gonna say uh, for now. Uh, I'd like to hand over the, the microphone to Professor Yates, who will say something more about the, the process um, uh, by which the volume came together and especially about uh, its honor and uh, Professor Burns. Uh, okay. Well, thank you, David. As, as David said, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the, the genesis of the volume. That is, how did the volume come about? You know, where, how did the uh, how did how did the project actually get launched, so to speak? If, if what David has said has really been the summary of what the volumes what is in the volume, um, I think it's also a pretty interesting story about how the volume actually came about. So, in fact, the, its genesis is actually several years ago now. Uh, to the best of my recollection, it really began to, to, to take shape somewhere in the early months of uh, 2016, so about five years ago. And of course, uh, even though it seems like a lifetime ago, in the, in the pre-pandemic world, uh, you know, David and I would cross paths several times a year. Uh, it would be a conference here, you know, a board meeting there, whatever, but we would, we would just, uh, because we were moving in the same circles, um, we would have the opportunity to see each other several times a year. And we would almost always make an effort to get together for a meal or you know, a drink or whatever. In any case, uh, one of our 2016 conversations, uh, and which one uh, I have to be honest and say is a bit unclear to me now, like precisely which one, 
Um, I do remember that the topic uh, under discussion was Patu and his work, and in particular, the appointment of his wife, Robin, um, and the appointment she had recently received to an endowed chair at the University of Notre Dame. That had been, you know, about, about a year previous to this that it, that it really become, uh, had become a fact. So I remember we were talking about this, and in the midst of this, it occurred to us that there was not yet a fish thrift in Patu's honor, or at least we couldn't think of one. Um, and, uh, you know, even if you account for the fact, as David alluded to, that, uh, that Feschriften were, are, were being published with less regularity now or in the recent years than, say, two decades ago, maybe, um, I do recall as well that the result of this realization was sort of a, a shared surprise. So in any case, uh, soon thereafter, uh, after confirming that there was, in fact, not a fish rift in honor of Patu out there, we began to seriously contemplate the feasibility of such a project. And by November of that same year, so that's 2016 still, uh, and in fact, uh, coincidentally, while we were both attending ARSBL in San Antonio, we really uh, sort of took the plunge. We really committed to doing our best to try to make this happen. And so even though it took us uh, longer than originally planned, and, and I'll say more about that in just a minute, I think it's fair to say that both David and I uh, ended up being extremely pleased both with the, the final product, but also indeed with the process and how it all came together. Um, so for my part, I can testify that, uh, that several people with whom I discussed the project um, have responded with comments such as, uh, it's about time, or wow, that will be a real service to the field, uh, meaning referring, of course, to the product of a, of a fish thrift for, for PAT2, um, which is, again, just further testimony to, to how the process is, has turned out and how it really uh, it turned out as well that David had my intuition about this being like a, a lacuna uh, or, or something we could really, uh, a hole we could really work to fill, uh, really was correct. And uh, I would go a step further and say that in my view, such comments as these were really spot on. That is to say, I sincerely believe that this is something that's long overdue. Not only has Patu served the Academy well and via numerous roles for almost 50 years, but he also belongs, in my opinion, to the relative, uh, he also belongs on a relatively short list of North American scholars of ancient North Africa and of Augustine who have truly shaped the field and what we think we know about the development of Christianity in that part of the world during late antiquity. So that's really how the, how the volume came about. Now, if you'll indulge me for another few minutes, uh, two or three, I'd like to say a few more words about Patu, the person and the scholar. So um, about Patu himself, uh, as I said, uh, you know, with the project itself was delayed a bit and all, not always through all, any fault of our own, but our original plan was to see the project through and have it ready by the fall of 2019, so about two years ago. That is, and it was also going to correspond uh, ideally to Patu's 80th birthday. Um, that was the goal. Uh, but uh, obviously here we are in 2021, so it's clear we didn't quite reach the goal. And um, yeah, while it is true that it wasn't, uh, this delay wasn't all the pandemic's fault, uh, it's fair to say the pandemic didn't help either. So here we are. As it is, uh, you know, it's the fall of 21 and we're presenting this volume um, to Patu. Actually, we're trying to help usher, help him usher in his 82nd birthday, uh, even though that I understand was actually already a few weeks ago. So we're even late on that, but that's okay. We're still gonna, we're gonna celebrate with him. Um, as I said earlier, we really are proud of what's here, and we're very glad to be able to do this to Pat, uh, do this for Pat too, uh, despite the delays. So, in my uh, humble opinion as well, one of the volume's uh, nicest features is the re recapitulation it offers of Patu's educational formation and academic career that we included in the introduction. Um, I'll let you read all the details for yourselves when you have a chance, when the, when the volume is actually out, you know, in hard copy and you all uh, rush to buy your copies. But I would like to offer here a few details about his career, as well as a few comments about Patu's work uh, and what he and that work has meant to so many of us. So some of you may be aware, uh, Patu is by birth a Southerner and a Roman Catholic. 
That is to say, he was educated uh, by the Jesuits in Louisiana, or at least it started, his process started in Louisiana. And then he, he, he uh, transferred to Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, even though, um, and, and certainly one of the signs of the Jesuits impact on him and its profundity was that, it, that he eventually ended up joining society himself. From here, Patu uh, went on to do graduate work at Regis College, as part of the university, which is part of the University of Toronto, and then eventually earning his PhD at Yale University in 1974 uh, under the tutelage of Yaroslav Pelikan. Um, so that's a bit about Patu's, uh, Patu's education. Uh, it, it's clear that it was heavily influenced by, by the Jesuits but uh, that it didn't stop there. And it certainly ended up with uh, being trained by one of the foremost scholars in our field from the previous century. Uh, from, from Yale, uh, Patu rather quickly transitioned into the professorate. His first appointment was at the Jesuit School of Theology in Chicago. And, uh, but that was definitely not his last, as many of you know. In order, this appointment was followed by stints at Loyola University in Chicago, and then after a transition out of the society, University of Florida, uh, before holding, uh, before Patu came to hold the first of two endowed chairs. The first was at Washington University in St. Louis. And the second was actually where uh, Patu was actually holding the second chair when I uh, crossed his path for the first time, you know, on a, on a personal level and got to know him a little bit. And at that point, he was holding down a chair uh, in Catholic studies at Vanderbilt University. Uh, and he had made this move in 1999, and he actually held this position all the way until 2011, when he retired and was uh, granted emeritus status. Since 2015, as uh, both David and I have mentioned earlier, uh, Patu has had it really, really rough. Uh, that is to say, he's been, he's been compelled to hold down a guest professorship appointment at University of Notre Dame, while Robin teaches and serves as the O'Brien Professor of Theology there at Notre Dame as well. Suffice it to say that we should all be so fortunate. Um, here, uh, and before turning uh, the mic, or maybe I should say the screen over to Pat Tu, uh, who has uh, graciously agreed to share a few words with us, I wanted to conclude with a few remarks regarding the ways that Pat Tu has influenced the study of North African Christianity and Augustine specifically in addition to all the ways he has served as a teacher and mentor to so many. So in addition to the dozens of conference papers, articles, book chapters, edited volumes, et cetera, that Patu has produced over the years, in my mind, there are three major works of his that, that truly stand out. Uh, these two are probably well known to most of you, so I won't go into great detail about them, but I am singling, singling them out for the influence that, they've had, that they have had and continue to have even down to our own day. First, and I'm, I'm sort of going in reverse chronological order. Um, first is the 2014 handbook entitled Christianity in Roman Africa. Uh, Patu and Robin published this jointly and in collaboration with numerous friends and colleagues. Uh, if you've had a chance to look at it, you're aware of its heft. It is, uh, it, it, is, it runs to over 600 pages as it digests more than 20 years of research, thought, and discussion on the part of many folks who worked on and contributed to uh, several grants, projects, and conference panels, all of which were dedicated to the study of Christianity on, in North Africa. And while it has already clearly been influential, it is a volume that, and, and I'm certain, will continue to be consulted for years to come. So that's the 2014 handbook. Second uh, is Patu's uh, 2002 book dedicated to the second most influential North African Christian bishop, namely Cyprian of Carthage. This, appeared, uh, this volume appeared in the Routledge Early Christian Monograph series and endeavors to, de endeavors to demonstrate why Cyprian matters to Christianity in North Africa and to the West in general. And it does this by describing not only his theology, but the political, ecclesiastical, and social context that provided that theology with both form and meaning. Suffice it to say that it's, uh, it, it is, if, if you're dealing with Cyprian at all, it's certainly in contextual matters, uh, it's, it's still a, a book that you, that is sort of a, a must read or one you must turn to. 
third and most, and third and finally, uh, is Patu's 1980 volume entitled The Development of Augustine's Doctrine of Operative Grace. Many of you know and have used this book. Um, I certainly continue to use this book. And this book, in my view, is important for at least two fundamental reasons. First, it achieves the exceedingly difficult task it sets out for itself. Uh, and that task is, is, on the one hand, keeping Augustine's thought on a highly vexing issue, uh, that is the role of divine grace and salvation of the willing human subject, in the discussion without sacrificing faithfulness to the, uh, it, those of you who've read a lot of Augustine will, will testify to this, I'm sure, without sacrificing faithfulness to the not always neat and clean aspects of his thought, to say nothing of the language in which it is expressed. So this volume truly uh, achieves, achieves this goal of, of of sort of threading this needle, if you will. And again, it is, uh, um, those of you who know it and continue to use it can, can testify to that. But perhaps more, more relevant to, to this venue is the fact that even after more than 40 years, this book continues to be read, studied, uh, and cited in papers, articles, books, and dissertations on North Africa and Augustine's influence, which is to say that it's achieved the status that most of us aim for with our scholarship but that uh, only a handful of us actually achieve, that is, lasting impact. And some, um, I'd like to conclude this little uh, tribute to Patu uh, with what, we, what David and I wrote on the final page of the volume's introduction. There we write, and I quote, Patu remains a model and inspiration for readers and scholars of Augustine all over the world. And David and I regard this, uh, this collection of essays as but a small token of thanks and admiration to this distinguished, call, distinguished scholar, colleague, and above all, friend. So with that, I will, uh, I will end my comments, uh, but I would definitely invite uh, Patu to offer his, uh, the words he's prepared and uh, that we might be able to hear from him at this point. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm having a, when I was not yet a teenager, my father was given an award in the small town that I grew up in. One of his friends got up before um, the sort of assembled worthy of the, of the village and uh, thanked him for all the contributions he had made to the, to the the life of the town and he, he he got up and he went to the podium and he said this is going to be very short thank you and he broke out in tears my mm -hmm. father had the gift of tears and my mother said we well, expected that that's what would happen and i have um i have had those moments in in seeing the the table of contents, and then more recently, as the as the dust jacket has gone up on the the uh, the, the web, in at least it's been in the Erdman's cat um, of the endorsers of the book. I think you all have all been extraordinarily generous, uh, and I am I am deeply appreciative. And so my 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 thanks to Prime First. Jonathan, to you and David, um, whom I well, I was surprised, and 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 I'm very well pleased when, uh, in a, in a, in a very roundabout way, I I found out that this was going to happen, and uh, very unintentionally for all involved, and decided I just better keep my mouth shut about this. And then on my 80th birthday, David was coming, and I've been thinking about it and looking forward to it ever since. I, I've also, when I when I when I read what you all had set out to do, and what James Ernest had signed on for you to do, thought, boy, that is really good. And and when I him and the and and began to read. The first essay I read was 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 uh, was Wilson Triggs because Wilson and I are working on a on on a revision of theological anthropology, 
which has sold the most books of anything that I have produced and, and, uh, and, and it's going into a second edition. Write a textbook and, and get it adopted. It, it, it will really, uh, and I was surprised about that, but, but Wilson led me through things that uh, we had never talked about. Uh, and I was just so really struck about the, the link between Augustine and Origen. I compared them in my mind, but never thought of what Wilson managed to show. And John Cavadini, uh, we were in a, a, a meeting together and I, I told him I had seen his essay, the title of his essay. And he said, you know, I got to sign that. I didn't know a thing about Ambrose and Auguste, Ambrose's influence on Augustine, but I sure learned a lot. And uh, th that's the other thing that, that I'm so deeply grateful for is the fact that, that people did not simply give to the volume something that, that they had ready and to hand and were, were very happy to, to contribute. And, and often enough, some of people's best work shows up in these kind of volumes but that people were willing to make a group effort, even if it meant that they had to move off of their preferred topics and that sort of thing. And uh, it's, it's, it's all the more gift for, for being truly a common project. It's something that, that we came to appreciate. I think all of us who worked on Christianity in Roman Africa had the, the great experience of a collaborative project and I see this one as, as very much like that and I'm and grateful, grateful for it, therefore to the individual writers uh, as well. Um, th there's another reason why this, this volume is particularly important to me. Like most people in our field, I have spent a career in departments that did not grant the terminal degree in either theology or religious studies. Um, and I have spent most of my career, um, not simply chronologically, but in, in, in working on um, programs for undergraduates and for master's level students. And as a consequence, for the most part, this book is a gift, not from the people whom I trained into the primarily the people whom I trained into the field, but the people whom, who became my colleagues and my friends in the practice of our profession. And in that sense, it's, it's unusual, but it, 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 it's, it signals and celebrates something that is so important to us, particularly through North American patristics and through the the, the sessions in SBL and prior to that in AAR, where those of us who are ha, have the opportunity to share fully in the profession through these kind of congresses and, and meetings and this sort of thing, and, and that we truly do have a, a kind of collaboration and a recognition of one another. Uh, as, as participants, as full participants. Um, this is not to take anything away from my appreciation of Joseph Wilson Trigg, who was the first in the group of the first doctoral students that I ever had the chance to deal with when I was teaching at uh, the Jesuit Seminary in Chicago, I decided to give a doctoral seminar in the university. And uh, Trigg and, as you may know, Michael Hollerick and Robin Darling Young were in that uh, in that seminar and it made friends of us that have remained ever since. Uh, and then at the, the other thing was the, the, the collaboration with students, particularly at, uh, at Vanderbilt University, my, my, my last appointment as a, a regular professor with, uh, with, with working with, with Alden Bass and Tommy Clements and Mark Del Cagliano, uh, along with Michael Donnelly, who, who went on to do a degree at, uh, at, at Rice. There was such a, a, a richness in, in working with, the, with, the, with them and in the, as master students who then went into different fields, different types of things, and therefore into different universities. In, in a certain sense, 
the, the most influential, d despite the, the 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 wonderful effect that uh, the, the wonderful gifts that I received from the faculty at Yale, Pelican foremost, of course, but but George Lindbeck and uh, and Hans Fry and and a number of other people uh, who were who were professors. The most important people in my education were not my doctoral faculty. They were the people who had me as undergraduate at the Jesuit Seminary in Grand Coteau, Louisiana, Edward Romagosa, at the Philosophy Aid at Spring Hill College, Arnold Benedetto, who died shortly after he was my professor of natural theology, at, uh, at, the, at, at Regis in Toronto, uh, the opportunity to work under Fred Crow, and then to have Fred Crow sort of keep his keep an eye on my first attempt at publishing a book, which was Lonergan's turning Lonergan's dissertation essays into a book, and it's it it brings home to me again is is how 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 important to us and to our 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 development and our education are the people who get us early in our careers and are able to, to shape us in ways that in, in some ways the doctoral faculty get us are already pretty well formed. And I think it's sometimes at, at Yale, uh, they felt like they, they didn't get enough influence on us because we had been so shaped by, by really good people who had had us uh, as undergraduates and as master's students. But I want to come back to the just the, the deep sense of appreciation for that that in my in my sense and in the way in which I accept it and feel it is that uh, being celebrated here uh, is is the the mutual recognition of one another, some in this way, some in other ways, that that all of us are recognized as is collaborating in the study in the study of the early church and in the various sort of resources that each of us brings to it and and this is this volume is is truly an instantiation of that collaboration by the ways in which simply by by focusing on augustine you have managed to broaden the perspectives that are brought to bear and uh in in this is this is when this is what's been most deeply satisfying and what a what an enormous honor it has been and is now to be counted a member of this great company of scholars thank you well thank you very much patu i think it's time now we're going to end this recording but you'll be hearing uh, from our three speakers and then from the respondent. And um, since this is also a live session, we'll, um, uh, several of us anyway, will be uh, attending uh, via Zoom or whatever uh, platform uh, is available. Uh, so um, thanks very much, uh, Jonathan. Thanks, Patu, uh, also for uh, your very a warm uh, kind words and uh, I think this will uh, take us to the end then. Good afternoon and uh, let me add my um, welcome to that of the uh, organizers and of course also my uh, thanks and acknowledgement of Patu Burns. Uh, my paper and the chapter from which it's drawn are offered with gratitude to Patu and in recognition of his scholarly example, not least as a keen, keen interpreter of the relationship between text and practice. So this paper is not St. Augustine's lectionary. The study of early liturgy is often driven teleologically. There's a quest for practices that will shed light on later and more familiar ones. Scholars have thus at times been inclined to read back the terms and practices of later periods into evidence for which they're inappropriate. And this must be said to apply to the common idea of a lectionary at Hippo or indeed in fourth century Christianity generally, 
electionary implies a developed and fixed scheme of readings, even if an incomplete one. Readings in the fourth century liturgy of Hippo, we shall see are best understood as a combination of course readings, traditional associations between texts and certain feasts or observances, and an underlying emphasis on choices made by the bishop. This mixture of the customary, the discretionary, and the course reading is not a lectionary at all, even if it can be related to the emergence of lectionaries somewhat later. But this pattern, I think, if we think about Hippo in its own right, is better seen not merely as one of readings, let alone lections, which prejudices the issue, but as a reading culture. Attention just to the lections risks yielding a distorted and incomplete sense of how reading practice worked in Augustine's Hippo. A more adequate approach to Augustine's readings, to which this paper can only be a small contribution, must set the evidence in closer relation to other ancient reading practices. We may be misled by thinking of these ancient liturgical performances in terms shaped by the very limited place of public reading in the modern world, when in fact most, most ancient reading was communal and most readers were hearers. Readings associated with ancient scholastic and sympotic culture, most obviously, are highly relevant to how we think of Augustine's readings being received in their own setting. So too, synagogal practices may be relevant, not so much as often they seem to be figured as a progenitor of how Christian lections worked, but as a, a parallel, as another part of a wider world of communal reading. The purpose of reading scripture and other texts in this setting was not so much to fulfill a liturgical rubric as to provide edification and a basis for instruction. And as Augustine's preaching demonstrates, the acts of reading and learned commentary are themselves intertwined. The liturgy of the church at, at Hippo was thus an exemplary but not unique instance of a, a Christian reading and interpretive culture still one that can be related, I think, to other ancient practices of discourse and art and education, even while it is exhibiting forms of repetition and tradition and other aspects of shape that might point ahead to the emergence of lectionaries and, of course, to the increasingly unique significance of the liturgical setting. The title of this presentation refers to G.G. Willis' 1962 monograph, St. Augustine's Lectionary, which is still the most focused study of this topic in English. Willis retained the claim of a lectionary in his title, even though his results actually tended to disprove the usefulness of the concept. However, Michael Margoni Kergler's very substantial monograph, Die Perikopen im Gottesdienst by Augustinus, some of whose conclusions are available in English in a shorter article, is now the definitive work on biblical readings in Augustine. And his title indicates a subtle but important step away from assumptions about electionary to the more diffuse uh, and more circumspect notion of Schriftlesung. Even a passing reader of Augustine's homiletical works, however, knows that his exegetical method is highly intertextual rather than based on exposition of a sole text in its own terms. His often thick interpolation of other texts, texts that have not technically been read in a liturgical sense, and his assumption that all these texts must be read in the light of each other, meaning, of course, also in the light of Christ, is characteristic of his hermeneutics, but also of his discursive performance. And I think this is relevant to how we recast the question of reading at Hippo. We could say, for instance, that there were more texts arguably being read or heard and discussed in Augustine's liturgy than those which had been assigned to lectors. For that matter, and this is the part of my chapter that I want to focus on for this presentation, not all lesung or even predigung is about schrift, uh, not even in church, not everything is about scripture. And in uh, this talk, I want to highlight some parts of my chapter in the Augustine and tradition book that uh, consider how reading extends beyond the canon of scripture in Augustine's liturgy. The best known example of this uh, is the reading of martyr acts on relevant feast days. So in Augustine's Hippo, the, the, the reading of the martyr acts might take the place of a liturgical reading of the, might be literally in the place where the uh, reading from the epistle or at times from the Hebrew Bible might have otherwise taken place. And this is not simply um, 
a, a different kind of reading the way it's presented in the shape of the liturgy itself. Uh, and this, of course, gives us pause for thought as we try and imagine what an emergent ordo of readings uh, was about, because it makes it clear that this was not simply a matter of addressing scripture itself. And um, so these readings were not merely supplementary or lesser. They were not like a third or a fourth reading at the office. They were actually part of the reading of the day. Augustine alludes to and preaches from these texts often. Um, there are uh, numerous examples, which again I refer to in the chapter. I want to just touch on the curious prominence of the Maccabean martyrs in North Africa as an instance which illustrates the relationship between martyr acts and canon and calendar in a surprising way. Now, of course, some of these stories, at least in first and second Maccabees, are canonical and therefore they might not seem like particularly good examples of stretching the canon to include martyr texts. Uh, but wait and see. There are, there are three extant sermons by Augustine, which is the same number as for the undoubtedly popular Perpetua and Felicity, three surviving sermons. This feast was kept on August the 1st. It was obviously popular. It was accompanied by the reading of the account of the seven martyr brothers from the second book of Maccabees, chapter 7. And this is treated precisely as a set of acta. In, in this case, the question of canon is raised by Augustine himself at least rhetorically, as an objection to the reading, ironically, rather than as a justification of it. Augustine invokes in one of his sermons hypothetical Jewish observers who would ask, well, why are you reading these uh, stories? How can these be considered Christian martyrs? So clearly the assumption was that it was their, uh, the, their generic form as martyr acts that made them things to read rather than the fact that they were in somebody's idea of what a canon constitutes. And his answer is not that, oh, well, the book's in the canon, so we're allowed to read it. His answer is that the brothers are real martyrs. Strikingly, this implies that it is the genre of martyr act rather than any other notion of canon that authorizes the liturgical use of the story. And there are some other examples where canonical texts function in the same kind of way. The feasts of Stephen and of John the Baptist are cases where for Augustine, the canonical text serves this dual function being chosen primarily for liturgical reading on the day because it tells the story of the death of the heroic martyr figure. There are a couple of other instances which show how this, uh, the cult of the martyrs stretches the, the the realm of what might be read. So two of Augustine's sermons, one we know which was preached in Carthage and another whose location is uncertain. Two of them imply a reading on St. Lawrence's Day from Cyprian's Ad Fortunatum, most of which consists of a container of biblical texts. On the one hand, they might squeeze in that way, but clearly the juxtaposition of texts in Cyprian's work is not the same as the way the canon presents it the overall theme of Ad Fortunatum being an exhortation to martyrdom. So this treatise seems to be, <clears throat> seems to be another instance of a non or a quasi scriptural element of liturgical readings connected with the, the cult of the martyrs. A different set of extra biblical readings treated a, a little differently, I think we would have to acknowledge in the liturgy of Hippo is that of the Libelli Miraculorum, the accounts of wonders performed in association with the martyr cult, so there's still a connection. These libelli are not quite comparable to the martyr acts. They do seem to be a separate category of text. They're read in addition to scripture and for specific reasons and occasions, but they are read in the liturgy at Hippo. Augustine discusses the background to this uh, famously in the 22nd book of the City of God. He says, for the canon of sacred scripture, which has rightly been brought to a close, causes the earlier miracles to be recited everywhere and to stick in everyone's memory. But these recent miracles are barely known to all the residents of the city or district where they're performed. All too often, they're known only to a very few and the rest have no knowledge of them at all, especially if the city is a large one. And when they are told to other persons in other places, despite the fact they are reported by Christian believers to Christian believers, there is no sufficient authority to back them up and ensure that they are believed without doubt or difficulty. It's City of God 22.8. Now, the Eucharistic Assembly and the opportunity that it offered for reading was the obvious time to, uh, to deal with the problem that he outlines. And there are a number of sermons which refer to these readings, uh, in particular to the libellos associated with the intervention of St. Stephen, especially in the cure of a blind man, which features in the discussion, I'm thinking here of Sermon 94, Augustine refers more than once to the libellus and its reading. Uh, for instance, tired out though I am and scarcely able to speak, 
accept ungrudgingly a few words from me. After all, we also have the booklet about the favours God has granted through his holy martyr, so let us listen to that too even more willingly. Another sermon, uh, 319, indicates that the St Stephen Miracles book was to have been read but was omitted because of the heat of the day. Uh, a different libellus is referred to in Sermon 286, which is a sermon on Saints Gervais and Protes. A series of brief sermons uh, extending through Easter week, Sermons 320 to 24, refer back to a miracle that had taken place on the Sunday. And of those sermons, 322 is actually the libellus itself. Not quite a sermon, in fact, but a witness to the effect of the martyr cult. Now, this type of work in its reading may not have had quite the same traditional authority attached as the Martyr Acts, even if there is some affinity uh, with the Martyr Acts as well as with Scripture, at least in Augustine's eyes, as his discussion in City of God had indicated. Rather, the libelli seem to be an evolving genre, allowed for in part by the precedent of the Martyr Text, but also functioning as some sort of limited analogue to Scripture itself. They add to the sense that the liturgical reading practices of Hippo would be poorly understood merely as a way to arrange canonical scripture. Rather, their character reflects some of what Augustine and his contemporaries sought in their concern about the limits of scripture too, as we'll see in a moment. Augustine indicates that the question of canonical writings was not completely settled everywhere in practice, even when he is suggesting quite the contrary. His clarity on this subject in a letter to the presbyter Quintian, uh, letter 48, allows us to believe that the Christians at Hippo were kept on a strictly canonical diet, except in the significant exceptional ways we've already noted. But Augustine also implies that there were different sorts of exceptions elsewhere in Africa. So he says, as for you, do not first throw the church into a scandal by reading to the people writings that the canon of the church has not accepted. After all, heretics, and especially the Manichees, often use these writings to throw the minds of the unlearned into confusion, and I hear that they like to hide out in your territory. Augustine goes on in the same letter to refer to a junior reader named Privation, whose status is apparently being negotiated among local bishops. And he says, I wonder whether he can be counted as a lector who has only once read the scriptures and those non-canonical ones at that, etiam non-canonicus. For, he goes on, if he is a lector in the church for this reason, then those scriptures are, of course, ecclesiastical. But if those scriptures are not ecclesiastical, whoever reads them, even in church, is not a lector of the church. This is curious. The way Augustine calls these unnamed writings not ecclesiastical by way of casting a shadow on their value, seems to exclude Martyr Acts or Libelli Miraculorum, at least I think we can assume that based upon what we know about his own practice. On the other hand, there's little reason to think these were explicitly Manichaean works, since I think that would have raised a more dramatic response. Surely it's more likely that these were either uh, pseudepigrapha among the Jewish scriptures, uh, or perhaps popular but otherwise non-canonical Christian works like the Shepherd of Hermas. We've already seen that exceptions to canonical status were allowed when the writing took a part in specific genres related to the martyr cult. But the quasi-scriptural pretensions of the other works were precisely what disqualified them. So the status of scripture was a two-edged sword. A solid libellus was a better liturgical reading than a dubious gospel. All this means that liturgical reading at Hippo is shaped by the canon and addresses the canon, but it is not really constrained by the limits of the canon as typically defined, even if scripture will, yes, accordingly have been its overwhelmingly its largest part. The reading in the liturgy at Hippo, whether or not canonical, was clearly shaped by the community and a rule of faith of which the canon was also a measure and reflection, but not an exhaustive one. So scripture itself despite the theoretical place that might be assumed and despite the preponderance of its use in Augustine's liturgy, scripture itself is not quite the heart of what liturgical reading at script, in Hippo means. Scripture speaks with unique quantity and force, certainly for Augustine and for his hearers. 
it speaks to that same heart, which is the reality to which the contemporary miracle stories and the historic martyr acts also attested, and hence to the same divine purpose. But that heart was not scripture, the heart was Christ. The library of the church turns out not merely to be scripture, but includes the use of material and miracle texts, which together with scripture, serve to illustrate that the reading culture was not determined merely by the question of how to arrange scripture in the framework of a year or across time, but rather to ask of what should be read in order to proclaim the truth of Christ. The reading practices of Augustine's liturgy are complex, if far from being arbitrary or formless. To speak of a lectionary at Augustine's Hippo is certainly fanciful to the point that it should simply be avoided. The reading culture of Augustine's Hippo, a better way to describe it, I would suggest, the reading culture does combine some customary lections from scripture for times and seasons, as well as customary lections from martyr acts for certain times and seasons. It includes course readings, and these are very prominent, and it also includes the considerable exercise of episcopal discretion, sometimes that itself also bearing upon the choice of how custom and course reading were themselves shaped. Discretion, the discretion of the bishop, is the most important factor overall, and that discretion extends beyond the boundaries of canon itself. Customary associations of particular readings belonging to particular days is certainly something we see clearly in evidence. In the full version of the paper, in the chapter in Augustine and Tradition, I've argued that gospel and psalmody, rather than scripture in some general sense, are really the consistent markers of how the canon shaped liturgical reading. While in theory Augustine upheld clear boundaries of canonical authority, he both accepted and added to the exceptions, not just from the so-called Apocrypha, but from the Passiones and Libelli. These stories all connected, connected the Christians at Hippo with divine power derived not just from ancient prophetic words, but from recent and local acts. And he also pursued a number of course readings that worked well for his expository agenda, some more clearly traditional than others. So together, this culture of liturgical reading, driven both by the bishop as well as by some aspects of custom, uh, is not just an approach to reading the Bible, but an approach to the marking and celebration of sacred time through the customs of reading. Augustine's sermons can be seen if we stand back and look at them in a more diachronic perspective. To, they can seem to reflect a church which is calling its liturgical readings into a state of order towards increasingly fixed associations of lections with feasts and with periods of the year, certainly. But that process had much further to go. As a preacher, however, Augustine seems less concerned by issues of structure and order in the external shape of the lections than he is in seeking the shape that lies within their stone, as it were, a structure shaped more by the gospel than by canon or lection per se. Augustine expected to encounter Christ in any piece of scripture, as well as in some of these non-scriptural texts. And these signs all referred to what or whom could be encountered in martyrs, in miracles, and in the sacramental life within which his preaching activity was grounded. Thank you.